With that, I would like to turn the stage to Dr. Davis now. Thank you, and I uh, appreciate this opportunity to be here. I am, uh, I just want to acknowledge I am uh, uh, subbing in for one of my colleagues who I refer to as a thrombocardiologist, um, Dr. Susan Smythe. Uh, uh, was uh, scheduled to give this presentation, and uh, she had somewhat of a last uh, minute uh, sc schedule conflict, so she asked me to do this, and uh, I was more than uh, very pleased to do that. So um, I am going to try to get us back on time. So some of the areas that I feel like um, even some previous talks have sort of hit on, I'm going to sort of move through. Um, the slides that you have in your handout, there's some additional information in there versus what I'll be showing up here. So I think you've got a couple of resources and I think these will be provided to you at some point as well. But I definitely want to try to get us back on time a little bit and give us, allow us time for some questions and answers. So, okay. So what I'm going to focus on is um, talking about management of pulmonary embolism and the role of this concept of pulmonary embolism response team. Um, I have no disclosures to, um, of concern with any of the things I'm going to be talking about, but I feel like it, I'm obligated. I am on the board of directors of the National PERT Consortium, and it's not necessarily something I should disclose per se, but it, it is an organization that I think has impacted me from the standpoint of how I sort of think about on where we should be moving nationally. And so I'll probably mention that off and on. So I do want to disclose that. Um, so this is a general slide. You've seen this before. Um, VT is common and it is increasing. And this is from an analysis from 2011 projecting out to 2050. And as you, the bottom line there is in adults, it's continuing to increase. And then when you look at specifically where does the effect of age, it is seen more VTE, DVT, or PE in the elderly. So it's something that we have to be concerned about with in addition to other chronic diseases, these type of acute diseases. Some of the burden of PE, 600 to 900,000 affected annually, around 100,000 deaths. And again, I'll show you some other statistics with the next slide. It is thought to be the third most common cause of death from cardiovascular disease. And also, and especially this hits when you talk about patient safety indicators, different things from like joint commission regulation, it's thought maybe to be the most preventable cause of death in hospitalized patients. This is probably reinforced by uh, AHA uh, statistics from 2016, sort of confirming, yes, PE's third cause of CV-related death. MI is number one, but it's, the rate's actually decreasing. Stroke number two, rate has somewhat plateaued. PEDVT, when you combine that, increasing in both men and women, up to, like I said, up to over 100,000 PE deaths per year. And just to background a little bit, again, I'm gonna sort of skip through some of this, but really one thing I wanna show is what I refer to as sort of the spiral that leads to the severity of PE. And essentially it starts with increased RV afterload resulting in, if it gets severe enough, to cardiogenic shock, and that's where we see the increased mortality associated with that. So if you look at estimated prevalence, fortunately, most PEs are lower risk of like 30-day mortality. And these are the ones that may be asymptomatic, may be an incidental finding, sometimes with cancer screening, for example, or they have no right heart strain or positive biomarkers like troponin or maybe one or the other. Um, but when you get into, and you can see the percent estimate mortality there, but when you get into biomarkers, again, start showing maybe some signs of what's going on with right ventricular function, and especially when you get into a massive PE, you do get into significant um, uh, mortality. So why do we worry about it? can be fatal within one hour after onset of symptoms in about 10% of cases. Untreated PE mortality can be up to 30%. Closely re linked to probability of recurrent PE with recurrent PE mortality around 25%. So to me, these numbers are all significant of why. And then when you break it down and start risk stratification, massive PE where you are in that spiral can be as reported as high mortalities up to 50%.
And this is, um, then non-massive PE is much lower, but at times that can be concerning as well, depending on the patient. Still standard for diagnosis, um, and this is what I even refer to as PharmD. I'm a pharmacist, this is PharmD positive for PE, as CTPE is still probably considered a standard as far as diagnosis. And then really that leaves us, what are the therapy for PE? And this sort of summarizes um, different aspects. Anticoagulation is still the mainstay, and you see all the different options, which in the last five years, we have um, many different new options, especially with the direct oral anticoagulants. But still, thrombolytic therapy, depending on where you look, is still recommended. Um, and then there's been more and more interest into mechanical adjunctive therapy, including extracorporeal support, which I'll show you our algorithm that we use, developed at UK, where we have ECMO as a piece of that puzzle. And I'll talk more about that a little bit. So I'll, I'll quickly go through a case. And 32-year-old um, female in the ED after a skiing accident one week ago, presenting with swollen right lower extremity, shortness of air, found to have a right lower extremity DVT, and they did check for a PE, and it was a segmental PE. No other conditions, but takes oral contraceptives, so there's a risk factor. Hemodynamically stable, normal tensive, normal cardiac troponin, RVLV ratio in the CT was less than 0.9, so considered uh, normal, given a dose of low molecular weight heparin in the ED. So I was going to sort of pose this, what would you recommend for oral anticoagulation? Um, and these are just, but I'm, not, I'm gonna, for sake of time, I'm gonna keep moving. Low molecular weight bridge to warfarin, obviously that's still the, an option. Um, the patient already got low molecular weight heparin, so maybe start rivaroxaban. Low molecular weight heparin, five days, then switch to dabigatran, stop low molecular weight heparin, start a pixaban, or any of the above could be the op options. All right, I, I'm, I'm gonna skip this slide. This is just showing, this is sort of old data from the standpoint of one thing we try to do is use low molecular weight heparin over unfractionated heparin when we can, and this is some of the data that just supports that. It's basically a somewhat of a meta-analysis that sort of showed looking at thrombosis rates versus bleeding rates between low molecular weight and unfractionated heparin. And um, it just sort of helped us confirm, because we still have some of our colleagues at our center that just, thinks we gotta start unfractionated heparin, but at times we wanna make sure we're using low molecular weight heparin and that's some of the data to support that. Um, and we try to give this first dose as soon as possible, and I'll go through our algorithm later and you'll sort of see how that fits into that. We do have you know, some things that we always try to think of, for example, if we're worried about something like HIT or if there's a contraindication to that. And then, of course, we do have these other options now when we think about oral anticoagulation in addition to warfarin with the uh, direct oral anticoagulants, the DOACs, and I'll talk more about those later. Um, and just one thing I wanna mention, because <laughs> still we, we use the term NOAC and DOAC, and um, even in guidelines, you'll still see sort of a mix between that, but I just wanna point out one thing. NOAC could, you know, it's referred to as newer or non-vitamin K, vitamin K antagonists, and then DOAC's referred to as direct acting um, because they focus on specific targets within that. And I just wanna point this out. Um, there is a case report of where a cardiologist wrote NOAC, and it was, was interpreted as no anticoagulant. Well, I'm probably, that's where I sort of think maybe a clinical pearl to take from this is if you are using abbreviations, maybe use DOAC, especially if you're trying to get a patient on anticoagulation instead of NOAC, thinking that it could be interpreted as no anticoagulation. All right, um, I'm gonna skip through some of the clinical trials here with the DOACs and VTE. The bottom line is far as recurrence, as a reminder, the DOACs generally, they were comparable to what was considered the standard of sort of heparin and noxaparin transition to warfarin, and I'll leave it at that. And these are all sort of the a summary of the trials. When we look at bleeding, um, they were either comparable depending on the type of bleed or actually showed a significant decrease in bleeding. So when we sort of look at um, the clinical trials, the way I usually interpret that is it was comparable in efficacy but it showed a significant improvement in safety signal with decreased bleeding versus warfarin, and especially with intracranial hemorrhage, and I'll talk a little bit about that. 
One thing that comes up a lot with DOAX is special populations, and I could spend the whole day talking about that, but I'm gonna just hit two. Um, elderly, definitely with what we've seen in the clinical trial data, a greater reduction in recurrent VTE in patients greater than 75. Again, if you think of what VTE, it is an elderly um, issue. And major bleeding lower with a DOAC. And you can see the percent difference when you look at that combined. And then the other thing, this comes up a lot, and that's the reason I include it, is um, what about obesity? Can we use the DOACs in obesity? Um, there wasn't, or at least to date, hasn't been a safety signal picked up within the clinical trials of the weights of those patients. When you look at patients greater than 100 kilograms, less than 100 kilograms, there wasn't really a uh, significant uh, or safety or uh, there's similar relative risk reduction. Renal failure, that's probably one of the biggest challenges. Generally, um, this is what I usually tell people, if it's less than 30, probably you might have to consider something else. But what was interesting, in patients 30 to 50 mils per minute, with those patients having a baseline increased risk of bleeding on any anticoagulant, the DOAX actually showed lower recurrent VTE versus warfarin and actually lower bleeding. So overall, DOAC versus warfarin, the way I usually describe it is a 40% reduction in major bleeding, similar rates of recurrent VTE events in regard to um, efficacy. So, and really the most feared bleeding of intracranial hemorrhage is a significant um, difference. And this has led to, I think, where um, American College of Chess Physicians, the most recent 2016 the AT10 guidelines, they, they recommend a DOAC preferred over warfarin for initial and long-term treatment of VTE in patients without um, cancer. Okay. And then as far as initiating, our, when you think about our options, warfarin, you have to consider bridge therapy, dabigatran, and uh, adoxaban's not on this slide, but they both have to be switch therapy. They have to have a lead-in time, not bridge, but lead-in time with um, parental anticoagulants, whereas rivaroxaban and apixaban, especially in maybe low-risk VTE patients, allows the first day you can start these and sort of get a first day dose effect. But you do use higher doses in, a, in the first three weeks with rivaroxaban within the first week of apixaban. Excuse me. Where DOAX probably shouldn't be used, severe renal or hepatic insufficiency. I think we need more data there. And if there's an initial high risk of bleeding, excuse me. <clears throat> or the other thing to consider is um, cost of the medications. We've actually talked about some of the other ones as well. Now, warfarin requires INR monitoring. And, you know, DOACs sort of get advertised as they don't require monitoring, but they do. And these are just some of the things you should think about with any anticoagulant. Compliance, recurrent thromboembolism, bleeding. All of this is follow-up monitoring necessary. Um, adverse side effects that may not be related necessarily to bleeding. These, the DOACs have prohibitive drug-drug interactions. So a good medication history and reconciliation when a patient is on this. And then also keeping an eye on certain um, organ functions, specifically kidneys and liver may be warranted as well because of some of the restrictions associated with that. So going back to our case, that would be classified as a low risk PE. We would obviously look for potential opportunity for outpatient management. We can use the pulmonary embolism severity index score to help sort of gauge that a little bit. Hemodynamic stability is part of that, maybe decision making and sort of for this case, one dose of low molecular weight heparin and if it was uh, appropriate, maybe prescribe a DOAC and then they're able to be DC'd home with appropriate follow-up. Okay. Let me move to another case. 72-year-old male, status post recent hip replacement two weeks ago presenting with uh, swollen right lower extremity, shortness of air, hypotension, tachycardia, found to have a DVT and PE, positive troponin, and a positive right ventricular, left ventricular ratio on the CT, evidence of right heart strength. 
given low molecular weight heparin in the ED. So I was going to ask you guys, but for sake of time, you know, what would you recommend for treatment? Anticoagulation alone, systemic thrombolysis, catheter-directed thrombolysis, mechanical thrombectomy, ECMO bridge to definitive therapy. And really, I think we're at the point with treatment of PE where any of these could potentially be on the table, but how do you decide? Well, first of all, where does guidelines take us? And in my opinion, there's some guidance and guidelines, but really, I think it's, uh, it's not strong evidence. So there's lots of options. Some guidelines, but really a lack of evidence. This is from circulation in 2011. Sort of this is starting to risk stratify to sort of guide the therapy. And I'll come back to this a couple times. Submassive with RV strain and coagulation along. I'm sorry, without RV strain. Submassive with RV strain. Uh, I'm sorry, RV strain, anticoagulation, but then sort of close observation to see if they decompensate versus massive with hypotension, again, anticoagulation, but then sort of what's recommended with these is to consider systemic thrombolytics. <clears throat> and then again, you know, low risk PE represents the majority of PEs. Submassive is sort of next, and then fortunately, massive PE is rare, but here you see the um, mortality and sort of the, this is just another a little bit repetitive of what I've already discussed, so I'm going to move on. And then we do have some scoring systems really at the diagnostic part of it to help sort of maybe uh, stratify with patients that may be identified with worse outcomes, the um, uh, PESI criteria, and then there's a simplified version of that that brings in risk factors. So. The bottom line is, this leaves us with the question, which therapy to use, especially in this patient I'm talking about, which you could probably put into maybe a massive PE risk stratification or at least an intermediate or submassive at a higher risk within that group. So best treatment is really unknown. There is not a standard approach. Strategies, when you look in the literature and between institutions and maybe even between specialties, is really all over the map varied by medical service, location, size, no consistency in decision making, no single team or clearinghouse, no accepted algorithm, no centralized location for care, no systematic evaluation of re results is, um, has been documented. And this is uh, sort of a diagram that from some colleagues from Massachusetts General Hospital, where they were one of the first hospitals to sort of develop this and sort of evaluate this concept of maybe minimizing and sort of multidisciplinary decision making. But this is the way they described it before they initiated this was depending on how they came into their healthcare system, you know, severe PEs identified, do they get anticoagulation, do they get IVTPA, or do they go to the cath lab, do they go to surgery, and who which of the teams and which of the specialties sort of, sort of drive this uh, decision making. And so as you can see, when you look at all of these dotted lines and arrows, for an individual patient coming into that healthcare system, it, it can vary quite a bit in regard to variation of care. So what they did was sort of simplify this and sort of this was sort of, to me, sort of the, the, the uh, early phase of this concept was where when the severe PE is identified, they activated pulmonary embolism response team. And sort of the logistics of that, and um, I'll talk a little bit about what we do in regard to that as another example, is they basically, they have a PERT fellow that sort of triages it, and within 20 minutes sends out a com communication that will include um, these specialists listed here, and they have a conference call and they discuss the patient and they sort of work through their algorithm and come up with a, um, a definitive treatment plan at that point. And of course, I've already sort of mentioned this, and you know, these are kind of things that you'd have to think about. Systemic thrombolysis, um, knowing that there's risk of up to 3% of intracranial hemorrhage, catheter-directed thrombolysis. Um, we have patients that we combine that with ECMO. And then also a surgical or percutaneous embolectomy as being part of that. And guidelines sort of provides us some guidance here, but still it's, um, uh, 
It's not a lot of strong evidence to the point that I think every hospital, every patient is treated the same way. And again, there's really what's lacking is no randomized controlled trials comparing these modalities to each other. And the data behind the interventions are limited to case reports or case series. And so there's a lot of work that needs to be done here. And um, I'm actually going to move through this a little bit quickly. This is just some of the background data on the use of TPA for submassive. Um, going back to the original, one of the studies that looked at the TPA, 100 milligrams over two hours, which if you look at the FDA labeling for like Altaplase TPA, that's what's in the FDA labeling. And this is some of the data with heparin plus Altaplase looking at probability of event-free survival um, days after randomization versus heparin and no thrombolytics. So this is one of the reasons that that has remained in the guidelines. Then we have PIFO data published in 2014, which is one of the larger randomized controlled trials. And I'm not going to go through all of this data. I think, um, you know, this was using tenecteplase plus heparin versus heparin alone. And basically, you know, looking at mortality at, at um, or he, hemodynamic collapse at seven days, showing a significant difference between tenecteplase and versus no thrombolysis. And, um, but a significant increase in bleeding. And I'll leave that story at that point. And then there's also been studies looking at lower dose, and this was just a meta-analysis trying to sort of look at all this. And I think the key message here is, um, you know, standard versus low dose indicates there's no difference in recurrent VTE based on this analysis, but it's very limited. And, um, you know, they did show maybe a lower bleeding of low dose, but I think, again, there's more work that needs to be done there. Bottom line, thrombolysis for PE, probably a threefold greater incidence of bleeding complications compared to heparin alone, and reported anywhere from 3 to 30 percent. Intracranial hemorrhage, 0 to 3 percent. So that's definitely, when we were designing our algorithm, that was a big topic of conversation. Significant proportion of patients PE have absolute or relative contraindications to thrombolysis, so sometimes it's not even an option. And then still, I think a lingering question is, could a lower dose of thrombolytic therapy yield similar results with less bleeding? And we've got, I think, some data to maybe support that, but I think we need more. And then, um, then we have catheter-directed lytic therapy. Um, theoretical advantages, direct infusion into the clot, allows for higher local concentration, use of lower overall doses of lytic agent. And you're able to do other things, monitor PA pressures, which may be a marker for um, sort of assessment, and then also the ability to fragment clot or allow greater surface area penetration of the lytic um, agent. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these studies because I promised I would get us back on time. So, and then we also have the PERFECT trial. Again, rather small, but still it sort of provided some additional information with this. Um, but I'm going to keep moving, I, I promise. And this is probably the most recent. Let me mention this just a little bit. The op the Optolyse trial, which was uh, presented at the um, ATS meeting in May, um, and sort of looked at different doses associated with catheter-directed and sort of um, will probably have an impact, I think, um, the more people start looking at this, because I think it does beg the question, what is the right dose when we use catheter-directed? But um, long story short, they saw a significant reduction in RVLV in all cohorts, which used different doses, anywhere from four to eight milligrams over two hours, four to eight milligrams over four hours, six to 12, 12 to 24 milligrams over different time periods. And um, all cohorts had zero to very low bleeding rates. And so the conclusion system, very low dose and short duration regimens in this trial appear to be accurately acutely effective as the regimens and other, like the Ultima and Seattle 2, for example. So let me cut to the, ba the chase here. What do we know about catheter-based therapy? And this is sort of my opinion and maybe some opinion of some of the colleagues that I work with. It is costly is one thing, and that's something we're very interested at UK is trying to get a better handle on the co cost analysis piece of this, more labor intensive than anticoagulation alone. It is or seems to be effective in improving RV function quickly, which may be a plus, but maybe what's missing is what's the long-term um, benefit. It can also achieve early thrombosis or fragmentation with lower doses, 
and uh, thrombolytic agent than standard systemic regimens. So this is maybe what we know. What do we don't, what we don't know? Does it improve, as I mentioned, long-term outcome, CTEF, um, compared to anticoagulation alone? Is it safer than systemic thrombolysis? Because we're still missing a randomized controlled trial to answer that question. Is there one technique or device better than another? For example, ultrasound enhanced versus thrombolysis alone. And really, at the end of the day, where does it fit into the treatment algorithm? So that's my introductory statement of where we're at. Considerations for advanced therapy, lots of options. How do we decide and who decides? Well, again, this sort of led to, and again, I, I uh, want to acknowledge Massachusetts General Hospital for, I think, being one of the first ones to sort of come up with this concept specifically related to PE to sort of minimize variation of care and sort of get the thought leaders at one, their institution to sort of work through at the time the case comes in. And this also led to, and I'll talk more about this as well, to the development of the um, National PERT Consortium. So just by a show of hands, is there anybody in here that either has a PERT at your current institution? Anyone? Yeah, all right, okay. So I'll talk a little bit about that. So um, the PERT Consortium started about three years ago. It's a new organization. It started with the idea um, of this concept of sort of working through, but, and then as there became more and more interest, and if you notice, these are currently the institutions that are members of the PERT Consortium that have an active PERT, pulmonary embolism response team, at their hospital is now up to about 60 institutions. And there's another probably 40 that are in some process of considering this as uh, something at their hospital. And as of our last meeting in June, we actually have now, whoops, I'm sorry, um, colleagues on the international level that are interested in this concept as well. And again, it comes back to you have all these options for treatment and um, how do you sort of work through that? So let me tell you our story at UK Healthcare. Interestingly, um, it was our hospital leadership, our, our um, CMO and maybe from a safety perspective, started this initiative called UK Optimal Care with the idea to streamline and to minimize variation of care within the healthcare system. And one of the first two initiatives based on what had been sort of observed in regard to our management of submassive and massive PE, they wanted pulmonary embolism to be one of the first initiatives. So it started off as we got a multidisciplinary group together. You can see the different specialties here. And essentially what came from that group was an algorithm for treatment, that then we were gonna start an education program. But at the same time we were developing that, about um, almost three years ago, was the same time that the concept of a pulmonary embolism response team. So as we developed this, um, we actually implemented a PERT um, later on in that same year as part of this. And essentially the way this works Patient has an acute PE, and the way this is, our protocol is designed, it's a confirmed PE. So when you're talking about maybe in a code situation where maybe a PE is on the differential, we haven't quite addressed that specifically with this algorithm. Confirmed PE in shock, massive, basically what we consider our standard is to consider them a candidate, are they a candidate for ECMO? And if they are, we consider cannulating them, putting them on ECMO as a bridge in time to more definitive therapy. If they're not, then we get into considering uh, systemic thrombolytics as what pretty consistent with um, guidelines, again, with uh, probably still more evidence needed. Then on the other side, if uh, not in shock, we then want to look and do they have either a positive biomarker or show right heart strain, puts them in the submassive, which I'm not a big fan of the word submassive PE, 
because it's really not the size of the clot, the size of the PE. It goes back to that spiral. Um, and sometimes I think that gets misunderstood when we use the term submassive or massive. Um, and we've even talked about that with our PERC consortium as we're trying to work on a, a guideline. Anyway, submassive within that, lower risk if they have one or the other RV dysfunction or positive troponin. And if they have both, and, it's, and also we look at, are they tachycardic? We put them in the higher risk group. Ours, what we consider our standard of care, if there's not contraindications to thrombolytics, is this group goes to the cath lab, catheter-directed thrombolysis. This, this group, anticoagulation, with close observation. And we've learned that the hard way. We've had, um, I can think of one patient where they were in our OBS unit and they had to get up to go to the restroom, which was a, about a 40 feet walk. And during that walk, they had decompensation and essentially moved into a higher risk. So just something, that, that's the reason we have close observation in there. On the low risk, that usually will lead to anticoagulation alone. And then this is the other part of our protocol, getting into contraindications of thrombolysis, and then a couple different dosing options. Um, the full FDA recommended dose for systemic or one of the lower doses in appropriate patients. And this is our 12-month review of our PERT. We had um, about 56 patients that sort of fit into the criteria of where we activated PERT. That's not all of our PEs, because it takes a while for physicians to sort of, I think, adopt this as a um, practice. And we've continued on with this analysis, but and this just sort of shows the, you know, I think this is over our first four quartiles showing an increase. And really, our PERT was designed to be activated for massive or submassive, but as you can see, I think this goes along with the education. We started getting called for low-risk PE, and usually these are more complicated patients, but that was part of the, the activation as well. One of the things that our 12-month uh, review, we didn't really see a significant change in mortality, but again, we're still looking at our data and trying to get to the root cause of that. But a couple things I do want to highlight was we did see a lower um, ICU length of stay when we compared pre-PERT versus PERT. And in my opinion, that may be getting into sort of this min minimization of variation of care. And um, we also show the lower bleeding events for PERT patients. And then one other thing that we had an interest in was to look at our VA ECMO patients. Um, and this is actually include pre-PERT and post-PERT patients. Um, but we had like a 66% survival rate on ECMO decannulation um, and 53% survived index hospitalization time period. And again, this is with massive PE. And that's, when you look at the literature, that's probably a little bit higher than at least what's reported out there. And um, five patients that did die had actually received concomitant systemic thrombolysis. 15 patients received catheter-directed thrombolysis, 73% survived. Again, we're talking massive PE um, in these rates. But one interesting thing I'll just share with you, um, and this is something that I think we're working on uh, publishing, is that we, we saw a trigger of serum lactate greater than six as a predictor of survival. Not really sure what to make of that right now, but that, does, that did seem to come up with our um, VA ECMO in massive PE patients. So I'll share that with you. So I don't know how well I stayed on time, and I've been fighting a cold, and I was thinking my voice would cut out, and it did. But where, where are we at? What's the take home points with this? Hopefully, the concept of PERT is the wave of the future. It, in real time, there's infrastructure which immediately and simultaneously engages multiple experts to determine the best course of action for PE patients. As you can see from that map, it is starting to grow throughout the country in regards to, and within that, it, there's a mix of hospitals. There's tertiary um, academic hospitals, there's community hospitals that have an interest in this. Um, it's also a multidisciplinary, which I think is really a wave of the future when you're talking about treatment for this. And then again, it has led to the PERT National Consortium. And we're to the point now, 
um, we're probably going to take out that word national because we're getting international to the point. And really the purpose of that is to focus on education, clinical research, and communication, VTE awareness, um, to really start helping answer some of these uh, questions and to continue sort of moving that. And just one thing I want to mention, every year there's a PERT consortium meeting. Um, and traditionally for the last three years, um, that's been in Boston, associated with Massachusetts General. But I was on a conference call just literally a few minutes ago with the board of directors, and um, next year it's actually going to be in Nashville, Tennessee. So, and that meeting um, it includes a one-day PERT consortium meeting of the PERT consortium members, and then followed usually by a two-day PE symposium, very similar. Um, at, what you guys are doing here. And um, in June of this year, we had about 400 attendees at that PE symposium. So just to give you some idea, but that will be something that will be um, pretty local with it being in uh, Nashville. Okay. I will stop. I don't know how well I did on time, but I am willing to take questions. Uh, I have a quick question actually. Uh, I've seen the uh, flow sheet that you showed us that the patient who have acute PE uh, on which you uh, activate the PERT uh, team actually. So these are the patients that you have confirmed PE diagnosis with, uh, with a CTA. Sometimes the patient who have really high pretest probability, but we are not able to do a CTP protocol on those patients who have like let's suppose acute renal failure or who have contrast allergies, so have uh, you guys like ever looked on those patients and have you activated per team on those patients or not? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a, uh, for us, that's another, that's sort of a next step is to start getting into the patients that don't, aren't necessarily confirmed by CTPE. And you know, like some of the patients you mentioned, renal failure patients, the ones that occur as high suspicion, sometimes our ED physicians will do like a quick bedside echo and see what they think is RV strain, and they put PE on the differential, and they'll go ahead and activate it. Um, and we may still treat it like it's a confirmed PE if we can get enough sort of evidence based on start piecing together, and especially that's where like the severity index scoring may help us with sort of on the diagnostic phase. Because if you notice, we don't have an algorithm for the diagnostic piece, and that's something that, interestingly enough, we're now like, we need that piece of this as well, because our hospital administration is interested in, can we impact how often we check CTPEs? Maybe patients that don't warrant it. So. I mean, I want to make a comment here. I think the part which you're talking about, I think there's, we should be heading because in a small, like a small community hospitals and where we have a lot of the private practitioners and interventional cardiologists. So everybody has their own different kind of criteria where they take the patient, patient comes in, sometimes we meet that criteria, sometimes we don't, and the patient is going for those uh, CDA, I mean, I mean catheter or uh, th th thrombolysis. So I think that's, I agree with that, that's what we should be doing, and it should be a, like a combined team effort with a, all the multi-specialities involved and to, see, to pick up the right patient. And also, now everybody is like going towards the, I mean, direct a small dose therapy, and we are not even doing any systemic uh, anticoagulant, I mean, the thrombolytics anymore here, you know. So like, after this, I wanna ask you like, after this new trial, which it came in with the um, optolyze, so what is your recommendation? Like, I mean, do, do we have any recommendation at this time that whether you use it still the old way or you are going for this, this is a smaller dose with a two hour, four milligram, uh, I mean, uh, the dose? Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna express disclosure bias here. What I encourage is develop a PERT 
develop, uh, join the PERC consortium. One of the things we're doing is starting a PE registry. And when, since Optoli Optolize came out, we've sort of redesigned our registry um, data collection to collect different doses so that we can start pulling this data together, maybe in real world kind of data, and start answering some of those questions. Um, I can tell you from our, um, at UK, when we, when the Optolize did come out, we did sort of consider lower doses with bars, our ECOs, mm -hmm. and based on that trial data. But we're gonna be entering that into that registry and hopefully through 60 institutions that will be part of that at some point, we'll be able to answer some of those questions. But I think right now that's still, I think it's, it's a question that even though with the data, I think, you know, I, there's not large randomized trials to answer that. That's probably, from my standpoint, the best I can provide an answer to that. I have a <clears throat> couple of questions. One is for uh, the cardiologist in the room. I don't know if uh, for the CKD patients, uh, has anybody ever looked into the use of TEE to look at the main PA and left and right PAs uh, as, an, uh, as a tool to diagnose uh, PE when you can't use contrast uh, for those patients in addition to the echo findings with 2D echo. And uh, on, on the flow chart that you had, I know why they excluded catheter-directed uh, TPA uh, for the massive PEs. Uh, if they weren't surgical candidates, uh, why was that excluded? Yeah, and I can uh, address that as well. Um, some of our interventionalists with massive, they will get them to the cath lab, cannulate them for ECMO, and consider CDT. And we do have a handful of patients that we have done that in. We just don't have it protocolized. We sort of leave that up to the interventionalists at that time to sort of make that decision. But we, we have done that. So, and you know, I don't think there's a lot of evidence for that as well, but that is, um, you know, I think that is potentially an option as well. This question is for Dr. Tarul Patel. So I was just wondering, uh, what is the uh, practice pattern in Nashville, in Centennial and Vanderbilt? Uh, we are pretty aggressive here. If you find a main clot in the, I mean, the clot in the main trunk or in the main branch, uh, we are doing uh, echoes. Uh, yeah, we the CT findings. So if the RV and LV ratio is significant and there is clot burden in the main trunk, uh, we are doing aggressively here. Um, that's, thanks. Uh, that's a great question. Um, I can't speak for the other. Can anybody hear me? Is it on? Yeah, really? probably better. Okay. Oh, this one. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, I don't know that I could speak for the other institutions. I know Vanderbilt is part of the PERT consortium, and it's kind of a conversation that we're having at our institution now. We don't actually have a PERT consortium. We have been doing catheter directed thrombolysis, but. Dr. Davis showed a, a great slide, which is, I think, where we are at, where MG, MGH was at several years ago, where there's just extreme variability. We've got several hub hospitals, and, you know, I'm aggressive, you know, but uh, I don't know that, uh, that all of our hub hospitals are. We've started to get referrals from some of our smaller institutions because they know we're doing it. But uh, as far as I'm concerned, we're a little bit in the dark ages, so we're actively talking about PERT um, and getting a PERT team up and running. Um, but yeah, we are, we've been fairly aggressive about uh, catheter-directed lysis um, and um, doing it in, in the kind of Seattle and Ultima-type patient uh, with, you know, either massive or submassive. We've got a couple of pretty decent cases, and, and we find that, you know, there's we've done a couple of recent really elderly patients in shock where, you know, they're not a candidate for systemic thrombolysis, not really a candidate for ECMO that have had fairly good outcomes with, you know, aggressive kind of treatment and just close monitoring. But one of the questions I actually was gonna direct back at Dr. Davis that encapsulates that is, you know, I think some of the, especially the kind of intermediate risk patients where there is, and, and I think your point uh, that you made about it's not the clot burden, it's the patient is really, really quite relevant. Um, you know, it's not always the size of the clot that matters, it's the lactate and the, you know, the, the, the poor urine output and, and the shocky state. But in terms of monitoring, um, I know we, there's the capability of doing PA pressure monitoring. Are you guys doing that routinely? How do you guys hemodynamically monitor the right heart cats and all these patients? Do you just monitor it off the ECOS if you 
do, I mean, how do you follow up these patients to help really define what outcomes should we be looking at to truly compare these different regimens? And I think that is an important yeah. piece. And I can tell you within the institutions, as we've had this conversation on our research committee, for example, and our protocol development committee, developing what we're trying to consider a national protocol, we see a lot of variation in between institutions. And so I don't have a good answer yeah. for that no, right now. I'm going to ask you another tough question <laughs> to follow that. Um, how important is clot resolution? You know, because I used to hang on to this as well. We lice because we want to get rid of the clot and dissolve the clot. And I'm becoming convinced that complete resolution of the thrombus, and, and maybe I'm totally wrong here, but is that, how important is clot resolution? You know, we know that in 90 days or, or six months, it, as long as the patient survives the acute insult, the patients are going to do the, do the same if they survive it, whether you give any coagulation, whether you lice, but it's that tricky few day period where they have to survive. And, and I was convinced before that we've got to get rid of all the clot, suck it out, you know, dissolve it, whatever. How important is that? Do you think? Yeah, and I've, as I've heard, again, I'm a pharmacist. Let me I know, it's a bit, bit of a tough question. A, that's a tough question, but I've, as I've heard others sort of talk about that, um, I think that's, you know, extrapolating, again, like the way recent studies have been set up is reducing that RV to LV, the PA within 48 hours. I think the net, what's missing with that is relating that to what is the incidence of CTEF, what is the incidence of 90 longer days of mortality, and I think that's the missing piece. So, I, you know, I think there's thought to be some link to improval of long-term survival or long-term like pulmonary hypertension, but I think there, there needs to be more data to, for me at my level with what I've read to answer that. But, you know, at the same time at the PERT consortium, if you love slides with the blue towel with big clots on it, that's the, that's the, that's the uh, meeting to come to because um, one of the neat things about that consortium is it is a multidisciplinary group and so you get the surgeon perspective and they report some great example cases of where they sort of demonstrate they remove the clot and they, they tell a very good story of where the patient went so but I think collectively we still have a lot more questions than answers there especially from my perspective. Yeah.